Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Vermont State Senate Committee on Institutions. Today is April 27th, 2021. I am your host for this afternoon's events, Joe Benning, your chair of the committee. We also have with us committee member Senator Mazza from Grand Isle, Senator Ingalls from Essex Orleans, Senator McCormick from Windsor, and Senator Parent from Franklin County. We are continuing our conversations as the session for this committee winds down with getting some updates on various parts of how the Capitol bill is eventually put together. And today we have to start off the uh, batting order. Chris Roop is going to tell us all about the current information about pension plans, pensions for the edification of um, those watching on YouTube have something to do with this committee's uh, ability to make payments to the various organizations that come to us because they are part of the process of what the treasurer goes through to figure out exactly how much we can bond for. So keeping the committee abreast of these kinds of uh, external issues is important before we leave for the year. And Chris, that uh, means I'm going to turn the floor over to you and you can educate us on what you came to us with today. Great. Uh, thank Welcome. you, Senator Benning. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Chris Roop and I'm an analyst with the uh, Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of spending uh, some quality time with Senator Mazza and Senator Ingalls over in the Transportation Committee, but um, this is a new committee for me. So, uh, wait, 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 wait. Let me say let, great. Let everybody, let, listen, let everybody know yeah. which chair you prefer, okay, when we're all done. <laughs> at, at the very his, end, yeah. If we still his have credibility, time his credibility just went out the window when he said great time <laughs> with you two guys. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever gone sailing on a ship before? Don't go with Senator Benning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we take you on a three hour tour. <laughs> And by the way, we do like humor in this community. Bring so. your scuba gear. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So welcome to Institutions, a better committee than transportation. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So I have, I don't have a lot of slides today. I have, my, my goal here was to really provide sort of a high level overview of about a dozen slides and leave some time for some questions um, for, for members of the public who may be viewing online or, or members of the committee who would like to take a deeper dive into pension topics. I have done a series of presentations for the other body earlier this session, uh, and those slides and the videos are available on the JFO website. So I could go on and on about pensions, but I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try to stay out of the weeds too much today because uh, like I always say when I'm doing these things, you know, I'm not a lawyer, an actuary, or an investment advisor. Um, you know, I'm a fiscal analyst for the legislature. Um, before I came here though, I worked for the city of Philadelphia for quite a while. And one of my responsibilities down there was being a voting trustee on the city uh, board of pensions and retirement. So I, I did that for about two and a half years. So I have a little bit of familiarity with how pensions work and, and sort of the ins and outs of it and some of the challenges that face you know, states like Vermont. So let's just start off with a really quick overview of how the pension systems here in Vermont are governed. The state has three major pension systems and they each have a board of trustees according to statute. Their memberships vary slightly, but the overall theme is that the employee representatives play a pretty significant role in the decision-making process. The three boards of trustees along the right side of this slide are tasked with the general administration and operation of the retirement systems and for adopting various actuarial recommendations. The trustee boards also play a role with choosing members to serve on VPIC, the Vermont Pension Investment Committee. VPIC is the body that oversees the investment and management of all the plan assets. And the treasurer serves on all of these boards and they all must agree to changes to the assumed rate of return. But at all levels, members of the retirement system, the members themselves sit at the decision-making tables and play a significant role in the governance of the retirement systems. So why are we talking about pensions so much this session? This slide summarizes the immediate issue at hand. Both the state employee and teacher pension systems are facing significant and growing unfunded liabilities. And as a reminder, the unfunded liability represents the gap between the value of the plan assets and the expected cost of the retirement benefits that have been earned by the active and retired workforce. Right now, VSERS is only 66.4% funded and the teacher pension is 51.3% funded. 
The unfunded liability across these two systems is almost $3 billion. And that gap will ultimately need to be closed by the end of the amortization period in 2038. Most recently, the unfunded liabilities have increased by approximately $604 million from FY21 to FY22. And that increase caused the employer's required annual payment to the pension systems, called the ADAC, to increase by roughly $96 million this year compared to last year. And as a reminder, the ADAC payment is the amount the employer must pay in every year to fully fund the normal cost, plus make a payment toward that unfunded liability. So when the unfunded liability gets bigger, the ADAC payment gets bigger too. It works almost like a credit card. The balance on your card is the unfunded liability, and the ADAC is the amount you need to pay to pay down that balance with interest. And these amounts are recalculated every year. So why did these numbers go up so much? It was due to a combination of factors. Economic assumptions were revised, inclu including lowering the assumed rate of return from 7.5% to 7%. Demographic assumptions were also revised. And these revisions were prompted by the fact that in recent years, the demographic and economic experience of the plans has deviated quite a bit from the assumptions. And the assumptions for the future have changed. In other words, we did not consistently earn the investment return we thought we would in the past. And the future investment outlook looks less rosy than it looked in the past. The behavior of the workforce also differed from what was previously assumed. And forward-looking assumptions were revised to hopefully be more realistic in future years. So in the bigger picture, the state's long-term retirement liabilities have more than doubled since the current amortization period began in 2008. Right now, the total unfunded retirement liabilities, including pensions and OPEB, or subsidized retiree health care, amounts to more than $5.6 billion, or approximately $9,100 per Vermonter. Pension liabilities alone have increased more than sixfold, from $700 per Vermonter in 2008 to $4,800 per Vermonter today. And subsidized retiree health care, or OPEB, which we currently do not prefund, adds another $4,300 per Vermonter of unfunded liability to the state's balance sheet. The rating agencies look at factors like this when analyzing and determining state credit ratings, and these unfunded liabilities are not trending in a positive direction. As these unfunded liabilities have grown, they've added stress to the budget. The unfunded pension liability must ultimately be paid off, and it has grown much faster than the overall payroll or size of the active workforce has grown. As a result, costs related to pensions are eating a larger slice of the budget pie. In total, our retirement liabilities consume more than 13 cents of every general fund dollar, up from 10 and a half cents four years ago. Pension costs now consume almost $200 million, or more than 10% of the general fund. And OPEB, that subsidized retiree health care, consumes an additional 50 million. Most of the general fund impact is related to the teacher retirement systems, because the general fund pays for the teacher OPEB and the unfunded teacher pension liability. VSER's retirement costs are allocated to the various funds that employ the active workforce. So only about 40% of the VSER's costs hits the general fund. So these liabilities and costs are substantial, but it's important to note that this was not always the case. When you go back 15 years before the Great Recession, both of those systems were close to fully funded. VSERS was actually 100% funded in 2007, and the teacher system was in the mid to high 80%. But since 2008, when the current amortization period started, future pension costs have grown faster than the pension assets have grown, and the costs have grown faster than the active payroll. As a result, the size of the gap between the asset and liability lines on the charts here, which is the unfunded liability, has grown. That unfunded liability represents the debt that ultimately needs to be addressed by the end of the amortization period, which is 2038. It's important to note that this gap has grown despite the legislature fully funding its required payments since 2007. But closing this growing gap will require higher ADAC payments in the future. Here you can see how steeply the pension payments have grown in recent years. The legislature has fully funded these growing ADACs every year since the start of the amortization period. 
and in some years paid excess amounts. But the funded ratio has still declined year after year. The hole has gotten deeper, thereby requiring higher payments in future years to make up the difference. As these pension costs have increased substantially, those costs have primarily fallen on the employer to pay. Employee contribution rates have not increased in recent years, and neither has the size of the active workforce. But the cost to the employer has increased significantly because the employer currently assumes the full risk when assumptions change or those assumptions are not met through experience. So if the systems miss their investment targets or their assumptions change, those additional costs fall on the employer to pay by default. And again, I wanna stress that these recent increases are not related in any way, shape or form to anyone underfunding the pension systems because the employer has fully met its obligations every year during the amortization period. The charts on the right side of this slide focus just on the normal cost, which is the amount you need to pay to the pension fund every year to fund the future year's worth of benefits that the workforce accrued that year. Employee contributions fund a portion of the normal cost. They do not pay down the unfunded liability, which is the employer's responsibility. But in recent years, that normal cost has grown due to changes in assumptions and as a result, employee contributions now cover roughly half of the normal cost. The other half of that cost, plus the payment toward the unfunded liability, are paid by the employer through that annual ADAC payment. So if everyone has been paying in their required amounts, why have the unfunded liabilities grown so much since 2008? The top chart shows you the impacts on both systems since 2008 and includes the impacts of the Great Recession. And the bottom chart shows you just what has happened since FY11 to exclude the impacts of the Great Recession. At the top here, you can see how the VSER system was once fully funded. Its unfunded liability was negative $11 million. The teacher system started the amortization period with an unfunded liability of roughly $275 million. A big reason why the teacher system had a higher starting unfunded liability was because the ADAC was fully funded during just four years between 1979 and 2006. And until 2014, teacher OPEB costs were paid out of the retirement system, which created additional unfunded liabilities. These things did not happen to the state employee system, but the ADACs have been fully funded for both systems throughout this amortization period. But if you add your way down these columns, you can see here how changes to assumptions such as changing the assumed rate of return or changing your demographic assumptions, investment experience falling short of your assumptions, meaning, you know, mainly your assumed rate of return, and demographic experiences deviating from assumptions have had on the growth of the unfunded liabilities over time. And to see just how big the impact of the Great Recession was, compare the investment experience totals in both charts. There are slides at the very end of this deck that break out these factors in greater detail. And that information was also included in a report that the treasurer released on January 15th. And they're also in the most recent experience studies. So why did this experience deviate from assumptions so much? Well, both systems faced a lot of demographic changes right around the same time period that the funds were battered by the great percent. Both pension plans have matured quite a bit. That means that the number of retirees drawing benefits out of the system has is increased a lot while the number of active employees paying in has not increased so much. So the number of retirees on the VSER side has increased by approximately 63%. And the increase has been by 77% on the teacher side. Meanwhile, the size of that active workforce has not really grown on the state side and it actually decreased on the teacher side. So overall, fewer people are paying in and more people are getting paid out. Benefit payments out of those systems have grown faster than member contributions and now exceed payments made into the systems from the employer and from the members. This requires money to be taken out of the investment portfolio in order to fully fund retirement benefits every year, which makes it harder to make up ground and close that unfunded liability gap. The average retirement benefit has also grown and it's around $21,000 a year. But a lot of this growth is due to the fact that we've seen so many more retirees entering the system at higher average salary rates than people who have been in retirement for longer periods of time. Here we see this dynamic play out in a slightly different way. 
The systems have seen positive income every year since 2009 from employee and employer contributions and from investment returns, with the exception of the investment losses in those great recession years. However, the amount paid out in benefits has steadily increased too, as more people have retired. This combination, which you can see on these charts, creates a headwind that slows the growth in the market value of assets from year to year and makes it harder for the systems to dig out of that hole and, and close that unfunded liability gap through investment gains. If you want to improve the funding ratio of the plans and close that unfunded liability, you need your asset growth to not just be positive. You need it to be higher than the growth rate of the pension liabilities. In other words, your money needs to grow faster than your expenses are growing. And that just has not been happening. My final chart shows you the big picture and speaks to the cost of inaction. If nothing changes, pension costs to the state will keep increasing between now and the end of the amortization period in order to dig out of that hole. We are looking at a combined total ADAC payments for VSERS and VSTERS of roughly $316 million in FY22, which is far higher than it was just a few years ago. This amount will grow to approximately $500 million by the end of the amortization period. And that's assuming that the hole doesn't get any deeper. In other words, we are assuming that all the assumptions are consistently met between now and then, and that current assumptions don't change. These costs are recalculated every year based on experience and will increase if assumptions are not met and decrease if assumptions are exceeded. But this is the, most, this is the status quo situation, assuming everything goes exactly as planned. And if we've learned anything from looking at the last decade, it should be that things rarely go exactly as planned. And there's always inherent risk that your costs will go up or go down. So the ADAC will keep crowding out other budgetary priorities in the future. And on top of that, failure to address the liabilities can also have negative impacts to the state's bond ratings, which can lead to additional fiscal pressures. When the rating agencies look at states, they consider things like their fiscal management, economic fundamentals, their demographics, their future growth projections, and the structural budgetary challenges facing the state and the ability of the state to respond to those challenges and to respond to anything unforeseen. Vermont has already had its ratings outlook downgraded due in part to its growing retirement liabilities. And fortunately, the latest round of ratings has, has held steady. It does take decades of financial discipline to build and maintain strong bond ratings, and it can be lost very quickly all of which should underline the importance of taking these liabilities seriously and ensuring that steps are taken to address them. So let's summarize everything on one slide. Since the Great Recession, the retirement liabilities have grown significantly and much faster than the plan assets have grown. Demographic pressures have had a lot to do with this. We've seen a very large growth in the number of retirees and the size of their benefits, though the state's pension benefits on average remain relatively modest. And this happened while the systems were trying to claw back from the impacts of the Great Recession. We've also seen the demographic experience of the workforce lead to higher than originally assumed costs. Changes were made to assumptions that will hopefully lower future risk to the plans, but they've also led to higher costs. As the number of retirees has grown, the systems are paying out more and more in benefits each year, more than employees and employers are contributing into the systems. And that requires assets to be pulled out of the investment portfolios to make up that difference. These factors all combine to just make it harder to dig out of the hole caused by the recession or to make rapid progress toward paying down the unfunded liability. They also increase the risk to the employer of higher ADAC payments when you don't hit your assumptions or the assumptions change. Overly optimistic investment assumptions and failure to meet those assumptions certainly contributed to the growth in unfunded liabilities especially when you include the fact that the Great Recession occurred during this amortization period. Failure to consistently hit those assumptions, as well as lowering the assumptions for the future, both led to higher liabilities and higher ADAT costs. You hear a lot of people talk about the historic underfunding of the pensions, which mostly happened on the teacher side. Along with the old practice of paying for OPEB out of the teacher retirement systems, this did contribute to the cost of the ADAC. And the fact that the teacher system has a lower funded ratio than the state system, which again was fully funded at the start of the amortization period. But this history did not lead to the enormous growth in liabilities from FY21 to FY22, or to the vast majority of the growth in the unfunded liability that happened since the start of the amortization period. 
Rather, the growth was mostly due to those other factors like investment performance, demographic experience, and changes to your assumptions. And like many other pension systems, the state systems lowered their assumed rate of return to 7% to more realistically match anticipated investment performance in the future. This might have the benefit of leading to less substantial deviations between experience and assumptions in the future, which would translate into lower risk of drastically higher ADAC payments from year to year. But this change certainly had a significant impact on increasingly unfunded liability and ADAC payments from FY21 to FY22. And it also lowered the funding ratio for both plans because this change means that the plans expect to earn less from investment gains in the future, thereby requiring higher employer payments to make up the difference. So that's the end of my slide deck. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them now, or you can also feel free to send me an email at this address at your convenience. I've also added some additional slides at the very end of this deck that Denise can send around with some additional data. And uh, I also have a link here that goes to much more longer and more detailed presentations I've given on pensions this session. But I appreciate your attention and um, look forward to answering any questions that you may have. So Chris, let me first thank you for putting together a pretty succinct um, set of PowerPoint presentations about what the problem is. I don't know if you can put a period on the end of this conversation yet or uh, want to stick your neck out that far, but last year I spent quite a bit of time telling virtually every witness who was coming into our committee asking for money that there was a strong possibility the uh, amount of money we were going to be able to bond for was going to be considerably less. Much to my surprise, the treasurer came back and gave us exactly the same thing we did last year. Are you able to say whether that may be uh, different next year? That's a great question. I think that really depends on what happens on the revenue front. Um, and, you know, I, I think on, in all fronts, whether you're talking about pension investments or just the state of the economy in general, I think there's a great deal of uncertainty about what the next, you know, 24 to 36 months could look like. You know, in a status quo situation, um, if we always hit all of our assumptions, you know, we always hit that assumed rate of return, um, the ADAC payments will increase by roughly 3% a year. And that's because of the way the statute is set up with our amortization schedule. So unlike your home mortgage, where you might pay the same amount every year for 30 years, we have, our, we have what's called a level percent of payroll system, where um, you assume that payroll will grow by three or three and a half percent a year, depending on the system. And the unfunded liability payments are, are structured so they increase at that same level. So the theory is that from year to year, it would not consume a greater share of the pie and it would just grow with overall budget growth. Having said that, you know, that all depends on you hitting your assumptions consistently and, and having no risk. So, you know, it sounds like the, the investment performance is pretty good so far this year. It always comes out to how do things shake out on a fiscal year basis. And then we recognize our gains and losses. They're smoothed out over a five-year period. So, you know, you might have a rock star year in the stock market one year, but you don't, the, those gains are, are recognized 20% a year for the next five years. So, no, I think it's, it's hard to say right now. I do think that these changes and assumptions um, uh, will likely lead, you know, it, are, are a little bit more conservative in nature, which means you're, there's probably a little less risk of, of missing some of your assumptions from year to year. And one of the proposals that is before um, the legislature, um, it, it's currently in, it, it just passed out of house, the house last week, and it's now in, in Senate government operations is to move what they call experience studies from a five-year cycle to a three-year cycle. Those experience studies are when the actuaries take a look at what happened in the fund, they reconcile it with your assumptions, and then they make a recommendation on whether or not your assumptions should change. The intent behind doing them a little bit more frequently is so you don't have as long of a time period where your experience might be lagging what you thought would happen. Because a big reason why we've seen these big jumps from year to year is because we did the experience studies and then we did our valuation studies, assumptions were revised, and this was the result of those revised assumptions. Were there changes in investment strategy that gave uh, give you the impression now that we're doing a little better than we had in the previous few years? Yeah, so that's a great question. This has come up a lot in the, the respective government operations committees and uh, the, the chair of VPIC 
has come in and testified, um, you know, quite a few times. You know, I, I think in, in recent years they've done a few things. They've they've moved to less expensive money managers. Um, uh, you know, right now that they have a very very large percentage of the portfolio is is indexed at pretty low fee funds, and the the percentile of our performance relative to other comparable pension systems has increased pretty significantly. So. You know, I, I haven't been around long enough to, to have the history of all these conversations around how the investment strategy has evolved, but they have certainly um, improved their performance in recent years um, compared to where we were maybe a decade ago, um, both relative to our peers and in terms of, you know, just cutting, cutting your costs, you know, invest smarter, invest in, in less exotic high fee things that are not proven to sort of beat the overall market. But you know, this is something that I think the pick really focuses on um, very intentionally because you want to hit your your assumed rate of return consistently within you know an acceptable level of risk, you know, the least amount of risk and volatility that you can possibly tolerate. Okay, Senator Mazza. That's great, uh, Chris. I just some, explain to me. I can understand it. This was this is a great overview. Uh, what what uh, Dave Coates is my neighbor, and he's been promoting a defined pension plan. Uh, is that not defined? Uh, defined contribution. Yeah, contribution. Would you help me ex explain that? Sure. As that seems to be around for a while, and 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 what what would that do? Sure. So there, there's two big models out there in, in government. There's there's what and including in these pension systems, sort of the dominant model is called a defined benefit, and, and it kind of sounds like. It's what it kind of sounds like. Um, your retirement benefit is defined by a formula. So that formula is based on things like how long you've worked, how many years of service you have, what, what your benefit multiplier is, and, and um, what your average final compensation was. Uh, you plug all those factors in and, and you can get an estimate of what your retirement benefit will be um, you know, in retirement. Um, defined contribution sort of flips that equation where um, your benefit is really not defined by a formula. It's defined by how much money is in your account. So um, there, there will be a system where in, in a DC plan, which is more prevalent in the, public, in the private sector, um, the employee may make a contribution to their retirement account out of their paycheck. It may be matched by the employer to some percentage. And then you know, your, your balance in your account when you retire determines what you'll have available for retirement. So the risk shakes out in a different way. So with a DB plan, the risk falls on the employer if your assumptions aren't met. In a DC plan, the risk falls on the employee. You know, I, there's pros and cons to both models. They appeal to different segments of the workforce. You know, not a DB plan may appeal to somebody who might have a 30 year career horizon, which with the same employer, which is likely a little bit more common in the public sector than in the private sector. A DC plan probably offers you a little more portability. So if you might work from place to place, uh, you know, that allows you to sort of take your money from place to place. And, but you know, it's at, at the end of the day, they, they function differently. The risk falls on, on the parties differently. And if you moved everybody over to a DC plan today, it would not solve this overall challenge. You know, th this unfunded liability represents the cost of, of really paying for the contractual obligations that the state has made with its active and retired workforce. Thank you. Are so we making uh, are we making seven percent now? Are we are we meeting our goals? I, I, nobody's been able to tell us that. So so far this year, um, we're we're above seven percent. And like I said, they reconcile this on a fiscal year basis. So, so what, what percentage you come out at is really sort of endpoint sensitive. It, it depends on what time period you're looking at. So for consistency, um, they look at it on a fiscal year basis and basically smooth out the volatility over a five-year period. Because you, know, you might have a year where you do 12%, you might have a year where you do 2%. You, know, you don't want your, your budgetary issue your budgetary contributions to fluctuate that much from year to year. So it's pretty common in plans to smooth that out over a period of time. Um, we, we have not always been meeting our uh, assumed rates of return. Um, they've sometimes been higher, um, much higher than they currently are. Um, but you know, one of my slides showed that when you back out the Great Recession years, th that, that's been a contribute missing our assumptions has been a contributing factor, but not nearly as large as missing other assumptions. And, and lowering that assumed, whenever they do that assumed rate of return, 
they, they take a lot of things into consideration. A lot of it is influenced by federal monetary policy. You know, what are your interest rates going to be? What do you think inflation is going to be? And, and what is sort of the, the outlook of um, the capital markets in the future? So it's, it's not as backward looking. It's more sort of forward looking. And um, it, it really depends a lot on what, what people's outlook of the future market is. Corey, you were in that business for a while. Is uh, three years looking back too long before you adjust that, or what do you think? No, I mean, it's hard to do one or two. I, I think three is better than five just because you have the opportunity to get get to it more often. Um, yeah, I, I think that probably why we looked five and further along is after three rough years, you probably have tough political decisions to make, like 08, 09, maybe 10. You, you know what I mean? But it, it yeah. does make a lot of sense. You, you want to be monitoring performance quite consistently. Senator McCormick. Thanks. Um, I'm not a, a player, obviously, but what, um, what modest investments uh, my wife and I have made over the same period, um, we've done pretty well. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm surprised what, why is the, are our pension plans, why have they done so poorly? And part of that question is um, uh, things were going pretty well, uh, if I remember nationally with the economy. In, in 2007, things were, were still going pretty well. Then you get the, the catastrophe in 08. And of course, Obama inherits that. But that bottomed out in 09 to give credit mainly to the, the Federal Reserve, but also to, to Bush and Obama, who had the good sense to follow their advice. There were problems with the bailout, but it did seem to work. And then throughout the Obama and most of the Trump years, the country is in a slow, steady improvement. And it's really until COVID that things headed south. So why did why were our returns so disappointing in that context? That, that's a great question. Um, the, the simple answer is, uh, you know, pension funds, like a lot of other institutional investors, invest very differently than you or I would do. Um, you know, I'm 34 years old. I'm not going to need my modest retirement savings for a really long time. So I can put all my money in equities and stocks, which, you know, tend to have you know, over time, one of the stronger returns, but some of the, the most significant year-to-year -year volatility and risk. Yeah. And I can let it ride because I don't need that money to work for me. When you're up and, and, you know, I can afford to have a couple years of negative returns because I have a long time horizon to make it back. When you're taking a look at a pension system, they're intentionally very diversified where, you know, they don't put everything in domestic equities. They'll, they need to also put things into... They need to put assets into things that protect you from inflation, protect you from downside risk, and things that are liquid, especially when you're paying out so many benefits right now, and, and things that sort of act as that ballast in the ship, if you will, that, that keeps you afloat when, when, when the waters get choppy. So there are times when um, you'll have asset classes that might be booming, might have you know, 20 plus percent returns. You'll also have some asset classes that might be in you know, negative returns or single digit returns. And, and every single year, who's highest and who's lowest in your asset class will change. So the goal whenever the, the investment consultants are trying to build your, your investment portfolio is what, what can we put, what strategy can we put together to consistently hit that assumed rate of return over time? Because when you're putting so much out in benefits every year, and your funded ratio is down in the 60s and 50s, you can't afford years of negative returns. Yeah. You know, you, you can afford years of maybe 5% when you were hoping for 7%, but you need to really make sure that you're being conservative and you tend to sacrifice risk and volatility in order to get that conservatism. So they, do, they invest a little differently than you. It, lo it, it looks to me like that is not what happened with the pension funds. You've described what I understand as conservative, lowercase c, conservative investing. And what you're doing is you're giving up the big kill in exchange for avoiding the catastrophe. 
that you're looking for something steadier and safer. So I'm still confused why would, and, and it looks like our the performance of our investments were markedly worse than the economy as a whole. And um, I would expect that if we were taking crazy risks. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, no, I think it's a really fair question. And, and the, the chair of VPIC um, is a great witness to, to invite in if you'd like to hear about this in more detail. I can tell you that pension systems nationwide, including the one that I came from in Philadelphia, and, and I think this was the case here too. Now you go back 10 years, a lot of people invested money in you know, what are called sort of alternative investments, things like hedge funds, um, mm -hmm. things that aren't particularly liquid and tend to be high fee. Um, a lot of plans, including here, have pulled out of those in recent years because they've realized that, you know, you tie up a lot of money that, and, and you pay a lot of money in fees, and they don't always have a proven track record of beating um, passive investment that's way, le that's way less expensive. So I think, you know, this is not something that you can steer the ship completely in a different direction overnight, um, but I think th the state has made some pretty significant steps at at bringing more of their portfolio into less risky, lower cost um, investment vehicles. And we have seen the returns improve. Having said that, you know, you're absolutely right that you know, the economy has done pretty well since the Great Recession domestically. You know, global events factor in too. Federal monetary policy and interest rates have an impact on, on things, especially when you look at sort of the fixed income market. Brexit has an impact, you know, th things that things that happen in Europe and in the developing markets um, ha have a bigger impact um, in, in sort of domestic pension funds than they once did 30 or 40 years ago. So, you know, I think it's been, a, it's a combination of those factors, but um, if you want to hear more about the, the sort of investment strategy over the last few years, um, I would, I would encourage you to reach out to, to the chair of VPIC because I think he's got a lot of really interesting um, insights to share about the, the various steps they've taken in the last four or five years or so. One, one last question, Mr. Chairman, and, and then I'll shut up. The, um, the, you'd said that, that a defined contribution approach will not solve our present problem. But my understanding is going forward, it would at least not make it worse, as I, opposed to a defined uh, benefit could. Yeah, no, no, I think I think the the benefit to a defined contribution plan from the for the employer is that you don't have the risk of an unfunded liability building up the way you do with the defined benefit. You know, you, you make your your matching contribution to an employee's DC plan on sort of a pay as you go basis, and then yeah. you know what happens in the market affects the employee. Then the employer is not necessarily on the hook to pay more or less. So I mean, yeah, that. that that is the the advantage on the employer side of a DC plan. You know, it, it doesn't, however, do anything to, to address the hole that we're dealing with now, that unfunded liability. You know, that 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 is due to the people who are who have been or are currently working. So so that that's why it, it won't do anything for that, but has impacts going forward. And there there is the small there is the small matter of breaking promises to people, making deals with people of what the terms of their employment are and that giving them the bad news that, well, maybe not. Or, or but that's, bank, but it just bankrupt. purely, what's that? Or go bankrupt. Yeah, well, I'm saying, yeah, from a fi <laughs> from the financial point of view. The alternative's <laughs> worse. Yeah. We're happier, we're happier. The taxpayers are happier with defined contribution. I get that. Okay. Or you had your hand up. I don't know if you still have a question or a comment. Oh, my... Yeah, I do. I don't know if my internet's been a little slow. Um, Chris, you know, it's, it's, you know, no use to crying over spilled milk, uh, but are we going to do an analysis on the fees that we did pay for investments over the last 10 years so that we can memorialize it and never, you know, hopefully make the same mistake again? Uh, that's a great question. I, I have not done any analysis on it. I can tell you that the fees are, are typically reported in the treasurer's um, on the treasurer's website under under pension funds. They put their quarterly uh, performance reports up, and you can see what the the fees look like there. Um, it, generally, I, I think the last time I looked, the fees are like less than a fifth of a percent. So um, you know, it, it, in terms of the the overall size of the funds, they're not particularly large. 
I've not gone back, you know, 10 years, 10 plus years and, and compared them. Though I, I do think that would be an interesting exercise. Yeah, I just wonder, I, I'm on a pension, not a pension committee, but an endowment committee for my local hospital. We just changed advisors really because, you know, they were charging close to a point and we were able again to go to a more passive investment strategy and save the, save that, you know, cost, yeah. if you will. Yeah. And I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't make, again, you know, I'm not a, I'm a, not a licensed financial advisor or anything like that. I, I would, I would caution that, you know, what the right approach really varies by every different fund. Right. And, and, you know, there are some funds that are, are very comfortable putting all their money in sort of indexed passive uh, funds at a really, really low fee. And, you know, there are some funds that are, that are more comfortable having a more diversified strategy. You know, I think there, there's a lot of factors that go into that decision. A lot of it's just, how does your fund behave? How mature is it? How, how, how liquid do you need your assets to be? And, you know, what's your tolerance for risk and volatility? It'll look real different if you're starting a new plan or if you have a plan that doesn't have a lot of sort of drain on the money annually for benefit payments, as opposed to something that you can kind of set it and forget it and you don't need to take a whole lot out of the portfolio. But having a, having a laser-like focus on fees and making sure that you're you're not overpaying for performance is really, is a really, really critical thing. And then, you know, one other piece that kind of pulled out of your presentation that I don't know if you can comment on, but since I was in middle school, I'm, I'm about your age, we were down 30,000 students. And had we had those 30,000 students in the classrooms, we'd have more teachers working, paying into the fund. Granted, somebody would have more, but a lot of these built around pyramid model population schemes where the population grows and not the other way around. And we're seeing the inverse of that. And, and, you know, is that accurate to assume that had we had a growing population and, and more workers, you know, we potentially would be funding this? Yeah, it kind of cuts, it's an interesting question. It kind of cuts both ways because, you know, you'll, whenever you have more active employees, you also have more people who are, are likely to get a benefit in the future. You know, I think, you know, I think the key point is, you know, a really, really mature plan where you have more people drawing a benefit than you have actives paying in behaves a little differently than a newer plan. Um, you know, they, they don't they don't turn around quite as quickly, um, and, and you know the, their tolerance for risk changes a lot, and that obviously impacts your your investment strategy. Um, you know, one of the biggest things we've seen um, really impacting the plans goes back to to demographic changes, and and a big factor is um, net turnover. Um, you know. The, the prior assumptions thought a lot more teachers would be leaving the profession earlier in their careers. And it turns out way more teachers have, have stayed in the teaching profession and left upon retirement. So those factors, how that deviates from what you thought are pretty significant contributors to how big the liability has grown. And actuarial tables have been updated. You know, Public school teachers are among the longest lived demographic groups nationwide, um, according to the Society of Actuaries. And, you know, that, and that's great. But, you know, whenever you've got life expectancies that are pushing 90, um, that does create strain on the pension fund that probably wasn't anticipated when these plans were first designed years ago. That's good. Thank you. Interesting comment. I'll have to think about that some more because my wife is a teacher and I don't know <clears throat> how I didn't anticipate she was going to outlive me by my life expectation, but that sounds interesting. <laughs> um, Chris, I want to thank you for coming by. I, I suspect very strongly we're going to have you back in the future. In the uh, beginning of each session, I try to bring the treasurer in to talk about how things are going just to make sure we stay on top of where things are developing in the world of how we're going to get funded. But uh, you've put together a really good presentation. I think you've given us some foundation talking points to talk about moving forward. So My thanks pleasure. for coming. My pleasure.